Welcome to Unforbidden Truth. I'm Andrew. Today I'll be speaking with convicted murderer Monica Mercado. Monica Mercado was serving 32 to life for second degree murder and attempted murder. On April 5th, 2009, Monica Mercado ran over 24 year old Porsche Davis, who was eight months pregnant. Monica struck Porsche Davis with a Range Rover, running her over with the car's front and back tires. Davis later said, I just felt my baby go on my back, and that was it, and my stomach was just flat instantly. Miss Davis had suffered a cracked pelvis, broken ribs, and injuries to her spine and shoulder. Her unborn baby daughter was delivered by emergency cesarean section. The baby was almost dead at birth, her heart had been beating only occasionally, her skull was fractured, and there was extensive internal head bleeding. When life support was disconnected, the baby died within a couple of minutes. Monica Mercado was arrested, charged, and convicted of attempted murder and second-degree murder. She is currently serving a 32-to-life prison sentence. Here is my interview with Monica Mercado. You have a prepaid call from... It's me. An incarcerated individual at... The California Institution for Women, Corona, California. Uh, my name is Monica Mercado. Um, I'm 42 years old, and I'm from um, Los Angeles. So can you recall any positive memories that stick out to you from your childhood? Uh, yes, my happy place was with my grandmother on my father's side. Um, that, those are my most happiest memories, um, just spending time with her. And um, she just made everything happy. Those are my happy memories. What about any negative memories that stick out to you from your childhood? Um... I, the negative memories that stick out from my childhood are um, having to live with uh, my mother's parents um, um, due to, you know, um, transportation issues and um, there was uh, somewhat of a struggle of stability there. So um, we resided with them and on the weekends we would go visit with my parents and it was um, I wasn't happy. I was sad a lot. Were your parents together throughout your childhood? Yes. Did they have a good relationship that you know of? Um, uh, there was abuse in the home. Um, my mother was a, is a survivor of domestic violence. Um, so I did experience a lot of that um, growing up when you know, whenever I was there. Okay, so that brings me to my next question, which did you yourself suffer any type of childhood abuse or trauma growing up? Yes, um, verbal and physical abuse. Um, I'm blessed to say that I never suffered any sexual abuse or mol molestation, so um, I'm grateful for that. But, yeah, it was most, mostly physical, verbal, yeah. That type of abuse. So what was your behavior like at home growing up, uh, going back as early as you can remember? Like, how did you behave at home? What was your behavior like? Um, well, I remember um, I, was, I was young. I was in um, probably elementary. I remember um, just kind of being, isolating myself, um, being antisocial, not really um, having friends like that. And then um, in my teenage years, I um, I started smoking marijuana, and um, I think I was about 13 years old when I started smoking marijuana. And and then after that, I just uh, became uh, very rebellious, and um, I didn't I don't want to listen to anything that anybody has to say. So that's what my behavior was like. So what was your behavior like in school, more so focusing on your middle school and high school years? Um, I was good in my academics. Um, I think I put a lot of my focus in that um, to kind of like, I guess, suppress the reality of, you know, what was going on at home or whatnot. Um, uh, high school was a little better for me. I was more social. I did have a group of friends. Um, I did fight a lot, though. Um, 
I got expelled from uh, one of my high schools. Um, then I got kicked out of my last high school, and I had to, I ended up going to like a continuation high school, and then I finished uh, my high school year there. So did you engage in any type of criminal activity as a juvenile? Um, no. Mm mm. Okay. What about what about as an adult prior to the case you're serving time for now? Did you engage in any type of criminal activity then prior to this case? Yes, I do recall. Um, I think I have two actually. Um, one was for petty theft, and the other one was for grand theft. And then um, I think that's it. And then um, then this would happen. So was that was that prison time or was that jail time, like petty jail time? No, it wasn't even no jail time. It was just like pretty much like a slap on the wrist because I wasn't I wasn't a troublemaker like that. So um, it was dumb, petty theft. Even the grand theft was like a it was like a store hookup and ended up getting caught up anyway. So I ended up getting like a, a summary probation for that, and I wasn't allowed to go to any. Um, I think it was Mervyn's stores. I could no longer go into any of those stores because that's where um, uh, basically I stole from. So are you or have you ever been gang affiliated? No. Okay. Um, have you been diagnosed with any mental illnesses prior to coming to prison or since getting to prison? Um, I, I can't say about diagnosis, but um, I, w- I was... Um, in a psychiatric hospital for 72 hours, um, I attempted to commit. And was that after you were convicted? No, this was before. Excuse me. Okay. Um, do you feel comfortable talking about what your experience was like or no? Yeah, that's fine. Um, I've been in, um, excuse me, let me just gather myself real quick. So I've most of my, uh, I didn't have many relationships like that, but uh, the intimate relationships that I did have were kind of long-term and both abusive, um, domestic violence uh, relationships. And um, my last one, which is um, the father of my two youngest sons, was very abusive as well. Um, there was a lot of infidelity there, a lot of uh, physical and verbal abuse as well. And I just couldn't handle it no more. And, you know, I just kind of tried to opt to a, a way out. And um, I took a lot of pills. And my uncle ended up coming over to my house, and he found me um, foaming at the mouth passed out on the floor, and um, he called he called for an ambulance. They came and picked me up. They pumped my stomach. Um, I came back, too, and I found out I was pregnant by my youngest son when that happened. And um, after they released me from the emergency room, I was immediately um, um, taken to a um, psychiatric hospital. And what was your experience like in the hospital? Um, was it was it a positive experience? Was it a negative experience? What was that like? It was horrible. I hated it. I couldn't wait to get out. Um, I would call my mom crying every day. Come get me. Come get me. Um, I just the the patients that were there. I was like, I know I'm not crazy, but I know I had to be there for for them to just kind of like keep an eye on me, you know. Uh, my first night there, I slept with this weird jumpsuit. I had no undergarments, nothing, um, on a hard plastic bed. I was freezing all night. Um, and then they put me in a regular room, and um, and I was there for two days. And um, I don't know. I just didn't feel like there was much um, attentive attention, you know, like to really, like, see what's going on. I didn't talk to anybody that just had me there, like, survey to see me for 72 hours. I don't recall talking to any psychiatric uh, doctor or anything like that. And um, so um, that's what I recall from that. It was not 
my most greatest experience. So um, I wouldn't want to go through that again. Okay. All right. Um, so let's talk about the crime you're in prison for now. Uh, you're serving 32 years to life for homicide. Can you walk me through everything that led up to the attempted murder of Porsche Davis and the second-degree murder charge of her unborn child? Yes. Um, well, like I mentioned previously, um, in my last relationship, it was a very, very abusive. A lot of uh, infidelity was involved, and that was a, a part of it. Um, I have been dealing with uh, the infidelity with him and um, the person who, uh, Portia Davis, who um, is my victim. Um, it was a very toxic um, encounter for three years. Um, anytime we saw each other, we just fought. Um, it was just sick. Um, now I can say that today. Um, then I couldn't see it that way. But um, um, So it was a lot of that, back and forth, back and forth. Um, so one morning, well, I had ended the relationship with Bryant Waller, which is the father of my children. And um, it had been like about three or four months since I had broke off the relationship. And he... Um, called me out of the blue one day, and um, I had, like, about 20 missed phone calls. I was out partying that night um, with a few friends, and I happened to go to the restroom, and I checked my phone, and I had so many missed calls from him. So I was under influence. I was drinking. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. I was drinking. I was high off of ecstasy pills, and... And I was vulnerable. I felt vulnerable, and um, I ended up answering one of his phone calls. Anyways, to make the long story short, we ended up spending the night together, and the following morning we went out to grab a bite. Um, we had planned a date for me and him and our boys to just have family day that day. Um, I didn't know what was going on with him. I didn't really care or inquire. Um, my assumption was that he was... Um, residing with Portia Davis at the time. So on my, our way back from Jack in the Box, um, he just started acting very weird in the car and telling me to, um, to move myself from the turning lane so I could just keep on driving straight ahead. And, and I couldn't understand why he was asking me to do that. So I just started checking all my mirrors just to make sure that like we were not in a danger zone. Um, I didn't see anything. So I, I complied. I, I, moved, I removed myself from the turning lane to keep driving straight. And when I was doing that, I glanced to my right and I saw a Porsche Davis standing right there waiting to cross the street. And that was the day that I learned that she was pregnant. Um, she was like big as a house, like, she looked like she was due any day, and um, I completely lost it. Um, but I continued to drive. I drove like two blocks down, and I had to pull over because I was hyperventilating so much that I couldn't keep driving. And um, so I pulled over. I was crying, and me and Brian uh, just kept going back and forth. And one thing that I never shared with anybody was. Um, it hit me so so hard because after my last son, he forced me to have an abortion. Um, so it's kind of touchy for me. Um, I think that was a very uh, vital uh, part of. I think that, that was a very very important piece of information that. Um, was left out of the, this whole situation. Um, I never intended to, like, do anything to her because I saw her. I knew she was pregnant, and I knew I couldn't do anything to her. Um, while me and him were arguing, going back and forth about her being pregnant, and um, we were discussing that um, that situation where um, he he literally beat me in the car and made me go into Camp Hill and have that abortion. 
Um, I was already like four months along when I had that abortion. And so when I was doing calculations, me and Portia would have been pregnant at the same time, same amount of time. Um, I just felt, um, I felt betrayed. I felt all kind of things. Um, so while we're having this discussion, I'm crying, and next thing I know, Portia Davis is walking up to the side of my vehicle. Um, then they start arguing. Um, so I, once she gave, once he gave her the car keys, because that's what she wanted. She wanted her car keys. Um, I just told him, I said, I'm going home. I said, and she follows. I said, I'm doing a citizen's arrest on her. I said, because I'm really getting sick and tired of all of this, and which was the reason why I just decided to end the relationship, because it was just too much for me to handle at that point. Um, I ended up making a U-turn to go back towards my residence, and while me and Bryant were still arguing in the car, um, we started a physical altercation while I was driving. Um, in the midst of me um, driving, um, I looked up to the middle of the street, and um, it was a, it was too late. Um, Portia was standing right there, and I just remember just I just kept going, and I hit her, and I ran her completely over. Um, I instantly went into shock. I I didn't know if what happened had just happened. Um, I didn't know what to do. My instincts were to flee, not to aid help, you know. Um, I wish I would have stayed at the scene, though, and probably rendered help however I could or called for help, but I didn't. I, I chose to flee. Um, the, the make and model of my vehicle was... Uh, jotted down. They made a police report that was given to them um, with my license plate, a description of me, and um, I was just in just complete shock. Um, I remember going over to one of my friends' house and trying to relax, and I didn't know how, how to go about doing anything. I remember my sister calling me, and she said, where are you? And I'm like, why? She said, they, they just came in um, and kicked Granny's door down. She said, they're looking for you. And I was like, who is she? said, the police. She said, what did she do? And then I started crying, and I told her, I said, I ran Portia over. And she, my sister was so upset. She said, why would you do that? And she said, you need to come home now. So I remember driving to Santa Monica where my mother used to live at. And um, I told my mom what happened. My mother was so upset with me. Um, and after that, we just kind of all got together and just we just kind of prayed. They asked me, what, what did I want to do? Did I want to turn myself into the police or did I want to go on the run? Um, and because I had a family member who was already living like that, I knew what, what it was like for her, and I did not want to live like that. So... Um, I just felt that the right thing to do was to turn myself in. So I turned myself in that day, the same day that it happened. And um, I initially was charged with assault with a deadly weapon of a vehicle. Um, and as days went along, then my, my charges changed. Um, she delivered She delivered her... Um, baby um, C-section. Um, she was born alive. Um, she had blunt force trauma to the head, which caused her brain to swell and make her convulse. Um, they had her uh, plugged up to um, um, life support, and um, and they gave um, Portia the option to leave her on life support or or unplug her. Um, she chose to unplug her two days later, and then my charges went from assault with a deadly weapon to a vehicle to attempt a murder on Portia, who didn't pass. And then they gave, I was looking at a second-degree murder, um, causing the death of a fetus, which carries a 15-year-life term. Um, 
So that's what I'm serving a, a, a murder conviction on um, for her unplugging um, the baby off life support. So I'm I'm done with my first term, which was the attempted murder term on on Miss Portia Davis, and I just started my 15 life, which I'm doing for causing the death of a fetus. Well, causing the death of a fetus, but her name was Genesis. Um, and I live with that every day. Just despite of what happened, whatever circumstances took place, um, that was still my children's siblings. And I feel like I I took that from them. I took a lot from everybody. So Ms. Davis actually ended up surviving? Yes, Ms. Davis um, survived. Um, she ended up um, having another baby with Mr. Brian Waller. And um, they're no longer together. I don't think they're together anymore, but um, she ended up having another child with him after the whole incident. But, yeah, Ms. Davis didn't um, die. She survived. Do you know if there's any lifelong injuries that she uh, battles to this day? Um, I don't know to this day, but um, well, in all my paperwork, I do know that um, I shattered her pelvic. Um, she had broken ribs. She had to go to a um, rehabilitation center to learn how to walk all over again. Um, she did sustain some um, injuries, and um, that's all I know. Um, she was well when she showed up for court, so um, she was walking, um, you know, with any appliances to help her walk or anything. Um, so she recovered pretty well. So uh, after you were arrested, did you stand trial or did you accept a plea deal? No, a plea deal was never offered to me. I had uh, to stand trial. Um, that was the only option. My um, my DA, it was her first uh, homicide case. And um, so, yes, I, there was never an offer of a plea deal or anything. It was just straight to trial. So I went to trial, and um, and I was convicted of attempted murder and second-degree murder. They gave me my time, to, um, not concurrent but consecutive, which means you serve one after the other, and that's why my time is so long. Um, while I was in the courts, I did win one of my appeals um, for a reduction of, of of time only due to the fact that I was uh, double charged. So it was either one or the other, which was um, causing the death of a fetus, which carried the 15 a life term, or pregnancy termination, which was three years. Um, and I had both of them. So that's why it was 32 to life. So they struck the three years and my sentence changed from 32 to 29 alive. So when you were convicted and received your sentence of 32 to life, how did you react emotionally after you were sentenced? Um, you know what? I, um, I, I was, I was in shock, honestly. Um, when I went to the holding tank, I just, I just dropped to my knees and I cried out um, to my higher power, which is Jesus Christ. And, um, you know, and I just asked him to help me, carry me through this time because I didn't know how, I had no clue how I was going to do this. It was my first time um, being in, in jail, period. Um, but after that, I just had to, like, come to terms, like, this is what happened, and this is what it's going to be. And that was my reaction to that. I um, I was sad. I was I was devastated. Um, but I also knew that I was facing consequences for, the, for my actions. So do you remember what the bus ride or van ride was like on your way to prison after being sentenced? Um, yeah, I was, I, was, um, I was a little shaken. Um, I was nervous to go to prison. Um, it was a long bus ride. Um, I believe it was like eight hours from 
Linwood um, County Jail to um, a California to CCWF in Chowchilla. And, um, you know, they tell you so many stories about what to expect from prison. So they always, you, my experience, I'm going to speak for myself, um, I was nervous. I was scared. I was nervous. I didn't know what to expect. Um, and when I got to prison, um, what what they said I would be expecting to encounter wasn't true. I, my experience was different. Um, I ended up going over the wall after three months. Um, I was in receiving for three months, and then they assigned me to a yard. I ended up going to see yard. And um, I have to say that my journey after that was pr- a pretty good one. Um, I had people that um, took me under their wing, um, directed me in the right way. Um, I ran a really good program. Um, and then I asked to come down here to um, CIW, closer to home, and get um, more visits, be able to see my kids. Um, so, yeah, that was that was my experience with the bus ride to prison. It's a little shaky. So how does your 32 to life sentence work? Do you have to serve 32 years before being eligible for parole, or do you have to serve half of that? Um, actually, um, there's a lot of things um, that have taken effect. I They struck, um, I believe, like four years, because my, my uh, board date was 2038, and it went from, I they took a total of seven years, I believe. Um, so my board date is now um, 31. Um, I go to go to a consultation in 26, and um, you know, I might have the opportunity to go home on my initial, or who knows? You know, um, I did. I've been getting in trouble down here. I have a few write-ups, um, so you know, I have to account for that. Um, but yeah, I have the possibility of um, of going home when I go to board, mm-hmm. if the courts don't let me out sooner. You just mentioned that you've got a few write-ups in prison. Have you got any outside charges yes. that have led to convictions? Um, yes, actually, I did. Um, I just recently came back from um, going out to court. Um, I was. Uh, I forgot. It was a, a low a low charge, but um, I was uh, I I got a write up for um, what was it? Um, conspiracy to inter- to introduce drug into the institution, um, and I went out to court for that. I went to I went to acid issue um, for six months behind that. Um, I got a DA referral, and um, I went out to San Bernardino Court or somewhere, Riverside, somewhere out there. Um, and I did. They, I got four months uh, consecutive, so even when I'm done with my time or if I get find suitable, I have to serve an extra four months. And was that the only outside charges that you got? Yes. Okay. Um, so nowadays, how do you spend your time in prison? Um, I program, um, well, right now I'm not programming. I just finished that, which is, um, uh, life skills and uh, substance abuse and just kind of sums up everything in, in one whole. Um, I started doing something different, um, I started going out to the rec field to, you know, just to work out. Um, um, I do a, I, um, I create a lot of things here. Like I do gift baskets for um, any holiday or occasion. Um, that's kind of my little hustle here. Um, I'm a beautician here too. That's what I was doing when I was at home. I was a beautician. Um, 
And, you know, and I have lunch dates with my friends. We go out and sit down and have lunch and just kind of catch up and that's pretty much it. Um, I go to church not every Sunday, but maybe a couple of Sundays out of the month. Um, and that's, that's how I spend my time here. So um, is there anything you'd like the public to know about yourself or this case? Um, I'm not a monster, how they um, make me out to be or sound. Um, no, Nobody really knows the circumstances of what really was going on. Um, um, my intention was never to hurt Portia. Um, but it just happened that way. And um, I am very sorry for her loss or what I caused. And um, and of course, if I if I could take that back in a heartbeat, I would do that, and I would do things completely different. Um, one thing that I would say is, um, yes, I want to go home, and I don't want to be here <laughs> anymore. But I wouldn't change this journey for anything in the world. Um, I learned a lot um, through all my time. I've been incarcerated 15 years already. And it has made me the woman that I am today. Um, I've learned so much about myself that I had no clue uh, was me. Um, and that's pretty much it. All right. So um, before we conclude this interview, is there anything that you'd like to talk about that we haven't touched on yet? Um, no, I think you pretty much summed it all. That was my interview with convicted murderer Monica Mercado. Check out my new website, unforbiddentruth.com, for extra content, ad-free episodes, and more. Head on over to patreon.com slash unforbiddentruth. Thank you for listening. See you on the next one.